This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's the place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome aboard, folks. Fasten your seat belts today. This is going to be, and if you're driving a Tesla, you have to keep your hands on the wheel anyway, okay, because it's going to be a serious discussion about something that almost none of us know anything about, but we use them all the time. We're very familiar with them. We know nothing about the therapeutic value. We know nothing about the plant as a plant, which we're going to talk about, and we really don't have any idea about how they influence our lives on an everyday basis basis everyday level. And we're talking about, yes, mushrooms, not mold, but mushrooms. And we're going to get a differentiation of that. And the person who's going to join us is Jeff Chilton from the West out in Seattle, if I recall correctly, Olympia, Washington. And what Jeff is going to do is going to tell us a lot about these things. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. No, it's my pleasure, Dr. Parker. I'm really happy to be here and share some uh, ideas with your, uh, with your audience. Folks, it's going to be so much fun. I was talking to Jeff a little bit before we got started, and this is not going to be a one one visit session. This is going to be, there's too much to talk about here. Let's say a word from the sponsor, and then we'll get to know Jeff, and I'll introduce him to you formally. Core Brain Journal is sponsored by Great Plains Laboratory. They are deep international biomedical testing leaders for improved targeted mind science details. As both laboratory and webinar global thought leaders. They provide the most comprehensive set of hard data measurement tools for real biomedical answers beyond guesswork. And they also provide multiple training webinars for both public and medical providers on how to use that remarkable data effectively. Check out their website for references and testing details. And take note, register for a complimentary test drawing. And this week it's going to be a OATS test, O-A-T-S, organic acid test, all from a simple urine sample. And it's going to be over at this link, Great Plains Laboratory, just phonetically the way it's spelled, greatplainslaboratory.com forward slash CBJ. Just go on over there and enter the drawing right now. It'll be a lot of fun. Okay, so let me introduce you to Jeff. So Jeff Chilton was raised in the Pacific Northwest. He studied ethnomycology, ethnomycology, friends, at the University of Washington in the late 60s. In the late 60s, folks. In 1973, he started work on a commercial mushroom farm in Olympia, Washington. During the next 10 years, he became the production manager responsible for the cultivation of over 2 million pounds. I'm going to see if I pronounce this correctly. Agaricus mushrooms? Agaricus. Agaricus, okay. Agaricus mushrooms. See, I'm so familiar with mushrooms, I can just pop it right out. And he was also involved, this is important, in the research and development of shiitake, oyster, enoki mushrooms, which resulted in the earliest U.S. fresh shiitake sales in 1978. So in the late 70s, he was co-founder of Mycomedia, which held four mushroom conferences in the Pacific Northwest. These educational conferences brought together educators and experts in mushroom identification, ethnomycology, and mushroom cultivation. Folks, if you're interested in mushrooms at all, and this is going to be an interesting presentation, we have to get, you just have to go over and get hooked up with him because he is the boss with the hot sauce. So he is, uh, he's written a book, a co-authored the highly acclaimed book, The Mushroom Cultivator, which was published in 1983 years ago, my friends. In the 1980s, he operated a mushroom spawn business. 1989, he started Namex, a company that introduced medicinal mushrooms to the U.S. nutritional supplement industry. Are you getting where we're going with Core Brain Journal, folks? He traveled extensively in China during the 1990s, attending conferences and visiting research facilities and the mushroom farms over there. In 97, he organized the first workshop for organic certification of mushrooms in China. He's an international guy. The founding member of the World Society for Mushroom Biology and Mushroom Products in 94, and a member of the International Society for Mushroom Science, Jeff Chilton's company was the first to offer a complete line 
of certified organic mushroom extracts to the U.S. nutritional supplement industry. Namex extracts are used by many supplement companies and are noted for their high quality based on scientific analysis of the active ingredients. And Jeff's on a mission. Hey, just as I am. Jeff's mission is he's, quote, unquote, I am challenging the industry for higher standards and transparency with mushroom products. I want people to have access to quality products and have the knowledge to properly identify these products in the marketplace. And I'm going to say, and use them correctly. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Jeff, thank you very much. What an outstanding, I mean, what you have covered the bases. You're a deep guy. You started so early ago on something that seemed completely arcane and now is becoming quite interesting. So, tell us a little more about how you got into this in the first place. Yes, I know you started working up there. You told us in your history, but what drove you to become interested in the, in this kind of uh, study? Well, for one, you know, Seattle area, Pacific Northwest, it's, it's evergreen. It's evergreen because we've got so much water. It rains here. Yep, it's yep. raining all the time. So we have mushrooms coming up everywhere. So, so really, I was fascinated by that. And when it came time to go to university, and again, remember, Dr. Parker, this is uh, the 1960s, and, and we also had things called magic mushrooms as well. So mm. that was interesting to me. And when I went to university, I started, uh, uh, my study was anthropology, and I, I was really interested in cultures, and I studied mycology as well. So I studied mushroom use in uh, indigenous cultures worldwide, how they use these uh, mushrooms, and mostly in terms of their, their native healing practices. So that was really my study. And after university, you don't really get a job in anthropology, unfortunately. So (laughs) I couldn't go much further than that. But I I was still totally fascinated by by mushrooms. And I thought, well, I should look into growing mushrooms. And I found out that there was a mushroom farm that was actually 60 miles down the road from Seattle. And it was the only mushroom farm in Washington State, so there wasn't a lot of choices. I went down there, I applied for a job, I got the job, I was ecstatic, and for the next 10 years, I, I literally lived with mushrooms. I mean, this was a big farm, 2 million pounds of mushrooms a year. It's interesting because in terms of growing mushrooms, Growing mushrooms in in, uh, North America, they're grown indoors in very large rooms, climate controlled. And every week, we would put in four brand new crops of mushrooms into separate houses. So we'd have four houses, new houses of mushrooms going in every week. And then four houses would be dumped. So we had a 90-day cycle. In with that cycle and with all the, the mushroom houses we had on this farm, I was literally seeing four new crops every week times 50 weeks. I'm seeing 200 crops, individual crops of mushrooms in every year. Oh, gosh. Now, think about that for a minute. At times 10 years, I, I've seen 2,000 crops of mushrooms when a, when a normal farmer in a lifetime might see, what, 50 crops, something like that? That is a I, big end number, John. <laughs> and believe me, I am living with these things because every day when I come to work and as a production manager, I'm going through, um, let's just say, 30 or 40 different houses with crops in every stage of development, and I'm watching them grow. I'm, I'm watching the harvesting. Every single crop, we were manufacturing 80 tons of compost for Mm. that crop. So we had 320 tons of compost that we prepared every week to go into those crops. That's what it was like. Well, what did you use for compost, if you don't mind my interrupting? Well, well, the basis for a mushroom compost is actually straw. Really? I would think, because I would be thinking they need a little more nitrogen in there with the straw. Well, no. The, the, well, here it is. The, we, you have to have the proper carbon-nitrogen ratio. You start out at 20 to 1 in terms of carbon to nitrogen. There were nitrogen additives that we would put into the straw. We would put in things like cottonseed meal. And some of the straw in the old days, they used to use straw for uh, bedding in uh, stables for horses. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we would truck down all of the the stable sweepings from the local racetrack in Seattle. 
Now you are talking my language. I'm a non-recovering organic gardener. I'm not doing it much, but I mean, horse mess is my favorite. There's no question about it. I mean, I have had serious, serious luck with horse mess. And that's why I kind of knew about the straw because I would, all the organic garden guys were saying, no, you can't use straw. You've got to use alfalfa hay or right. something with a little bit of nitrogen. Yeah, in it. But I'm, yeah. That's why I'm asking you. So, exactly. so you had some serious stuff cooking there. That's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, you know the thing with, with horse manure is that it's chock full of microorganisms. So when you have that blended in with your straw and you start to add water to that, those micro, because a compost is a mixture of microorganisms that they go to work and that with the use of that nitrogen, they will start to break down the cellulose in that straw. And that's what heats that compost up. So when your compost starts to get hot, that's microbes in action. That and is so can you imagine? Here's, here's what our compost pile looked like. It was six foot wide by six foot high by 200 feet long. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I got the front end diameter, 200 feet long. That was, a little bro- that was a little larger than my garden, I can tell you that. <laughs> well, well oh we, my gosh. we moved it around with, with three-yard bucket front end loaders. Yeah, and yeah. We, when we turned it, we had a machine that would just go down that row, and it would literally go in and chew it up and throw it back, add water, blend it up. And these are perfectly beautiful, long compost piles. But we had four of those going every week. Fantastic. We had to wet up the straw and do other things prior to putting them in that to what we call a rick. That is fantastic. So, so interesting. Well, our listeners may not be as interested in compost as I am, but I I thought since you mentioned (laughs) it, I I I wanted to go down there. I also, when we get into the mushroom things, I want to talk about the varieties of mushrooms because when I was a kid, I was raised in uh, northern Indiana. One of my buddies and I, we were fishing buddies. We fished all through the, there were 110 lakes in that one county where I grew up. So we were fly fishing for whatever. Oh, lucky you. It was a lot of fun. But the bottom line is he was a, he was more outdoor guy. His his father had the whole thing going. And he'd trap in us, and we'd go out there and get morel mushrooms. Morels, of course, yeah. And we had we would have fun. We'd do some catfish, cook them with morels. Oh, I mean, these are like you know when you're a kid, you think you're in Paris or something. The place is so unbelievable. It's great. Yeah. Anyway, well. so go ahead. I'm sorry, I got off the subject. No, 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 no. Ahead. So let's take a moment. We're we're well into this beginning of the conversation. We have a picture of the physical plant. Now let's get our kind of brain hat, microcellular, whatever hat on, and look at the plant itself. Tell us, because I personally don't really understand the varieties of mushrooms, what you will start talking about when you break it down in terms of the usability and, and the utilitarian value of each of these different aspects of mushrooms. So please start wherever you'd like to. Well, in terms of this uh, fungal organism that we know and call a mushroom, a mushroom is just one part, what we would call a plant part of this actual organism. And of course, there's no seeds to plant mushrooms. You know, Mm -hmm. mushrooms don't produce seeds, they produce spores. So Mm -hmm. to start off what we'll call the life cycle of this organism, we have a spore. And that spore will germinate into a very, very fine filament. And when multiple spores germinate, and those filaments grow, and then they will come together and they will form a network. This network is called mycelium. Now, the mycelium is something that we do not see that normally because it is in the soil, it is in wood, it is normally buried in its substrate. The substrate meaning the wood or the soil or whatever it's feeding on. Mycelium is one of nature's decomposers. That's what fungi do out there. They're decomposing organic matter and ultimately turning it into humus. Because you know what happens is we've got a succession of microorganisms feeding on all that organic matter. So one one will catch it at a certain stage and it will take the nutrients it wants. The next thing you know, when it's finished, it will kind of die away and maybe a bacteria will get in or maybe a a different fungus will get in there. So there's a succession 
of microorganisms that are breaking down all the organic matter out there, the mm -hmm. leaf litter, the branches that come off, all of the agricultural waste that is produced in the Midwest from all of those agricultural products. It's all being broken down by fungi and other microorganisms. So we have a spore. We have mycelium. When conditions are right, and for your morel hunters, that would be springtime. For us in the Pacific Northwest, and we do have morels too, but generally speaking, in the fall, temperature drops, the rains come, and think about it this way, during those nice warm summer temperatures, that mycelium, man, it's out there spreading, and it is seeking more and more nutrients. Fall comes, it slows right down. The temperature now is cooler, it's not growing, it'll stop, but it has got all of these nutrients that is, it has built up. It will produce a mushroom. So that mushroom now is what we normally see. And the mushroom goes through its cycle. It opens up its cap. Underneath are all of these gills. And what comes out of those gills? The spores. So mm -hmm. this is the complete life cycle of this mushroom organism. And again, what we normally focus on is we focus on the mushroom because, A, we're, we like to eat it. So we're out there hunting it down to eat it. Basic. <laughs> and it's very obvious, right? <laughs> when you're out there. Now, not always obvious. If you're not looking for them, I mean, a morel, it's like it's hiding from you, right? And until yeah. you, you get a mushroom eyes on, you don't see it. You walk right by it. You don't even know it's there because it, in a way it's camouflaged mm -hmm. with all the different colors of the leaves on the ground and everything. That's what I love and is such, so fascinating about the mushroom hunt. The mushroom hunt is a treasure hunt, right? You're out there going, am I going to find these mushrooms or not? You're, it's like when you find them, it's like an oh my goodness moment, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I found this thing and it is literally a treasure hunt. But that is what you, you have to remember about this is that we've got different stages of this organism. And ultimately, each stage will have a certain amount of the, for example, medicinal compounds that we would look for if we want to use that as a supplement. Now, using it as a supplement and having the medicinal compounds is one thing, but the actual nutritional value of the mushroom is really, really good. So let me interrupt to ask you this question. You took it, I'm glad you could take a little break there because what I was thinking about, and, and you need to help clarify this for me, this isn't knowledge, this is a curiosity. But my sense of it is that the mushroom is a manifestation of this underground large organism, that it's the visible representation of these mycelium that are all connected. And the whole thing is an organism. And the mushroom is like a finger sticking up out of the dirt, whereas the mycelium and all this going on under the surface is an entire organism, somewhat like aspens in Colorado. Aspens run and they're all connected uh, underneath in the, in the same kind of way as mushrooms are. I think they are. So could you clarify that point? Well, sure. You know what? The mycelial network, as long as it has food, it will stay intact. And this is where for a mushroom hunter, they know that when they find mushrooms, they can use to go back the next year and the next year and they will get mushrooms from that same location. As long as there's a continual food source, that mycelium will stay alive. And a mycelium will continue to spread until it hits something where all of a sudden it's like, okay, either no food, or I've re just reached a lake and I can't go any further, or a river or something. So it can continue to spread. Now, something you need to know is that, that different mushroom species they do not come together and fuse. When they reach each other, there's just a, a line. It's like a wall. They mm -hmm. do not come together at all. So different species, and there's, you know, when you go out there walking through the woods, there's a lot of species that you find. So each one has its own colony that is formed, but those colonies do not fuse together at all. So we've got separate entities out there, but yes, the mycelium will spread as long as there's nutrient. One of the fascinating ways to see this is, have you ever seen uh, what's called a fairy ring? 
I was thinking about asking you about it. <laughs> yes. Well, still, well, some of our guests may not know about it, but I've always been fascinated with fairy rings. Well, yeah, yeah. If you and where you where you really notice them, because actually there's probably a lot more of them in the woods, but they're not this perfect ring. And we call it a fairy ring because we see it like in a lawn or somewhere we can actually view the manifestation of it. And what happens is that, and this is just like what happens with mycelium if I put it in a Petri plate. It starts out in the center and it starts to spread out in a perfect circle, a radial manner. And mm -hmm. again, it will go out. And the reason it's going out, it's going out from that one point it's got nutrients. So it's moving outwards, consuming those nutrients. Mm -hmm. And where the mushroom is formed is on the outer edge of where that mycelium grows. So the first year you see it, and maybe it's 10 feet out from the center in a perfect circle. The next year, it'll be 20 feet out in a perfect circle. Oh my gosh, that's so, so interesting. So what's happening is it's continuing to go out for new nutrients. Now, what you have to remember is that that doesn't mean that this organism is still complete from the very center. It's not, because in where it has already gone out and consumed the nutrients, if those nutrients are exhausted from that one point, that mycelium will simply die. And the reason why we see the mushrooms is because that's the point where it is the, the most active and it has got all those nutrients right at that point. And anything behind it that's still alive will be feeding food out to that, that growth on the periphery to keep it moving out, looking for more nutrients. But the stuff back in the center, and you'll even see the fact that color of the grass will shift. It'll actually shift from being a certain green to a different green because that uh, mycelium has taken certain nutrients and either helped the grass or in some cases it could have hindered the grass, but you'll see the color changes too. So it sounds like there's some truth in the idea that it is an entire organism. It's a plant organism that has a different architecture than we think of as a tree just growing up. Obviously a tree has a certain predictable architecture that we can see, but this is what I think fascinating about it is you can't see it. You can't really see what the architecture is. Only by default, if a mushroom pops up, can you say, okay, there's something going on here beneath the surface, which to me is obviously as a psychiatric professional and thinking about meanings beneath the surface. Yes, of course. Our whole thing at Core Brain Journal is things, <laughs> things beneath the surface. Yeah. So this fits right in with our conversation because so much in psychiatry is missed because we're looking at surface things, not even not even looking beneath the surface. So this is definitely a theme without, obviously we didn't rehearse this, this is just one of these things that comes up. Absolutely. So then the next question is, let's take a moment before we get into this break later on about how you break down the, I think people would be interested, okay, we're talking about mushrooms and maybe everybody here isn't as interested in, in mushrooms as I am, but they're going to say, okay, what's the point, guys? What are you getting at here? What are we really listening for? I think now we get down to a little bit, we've got a little bit of the architecture of what's going on, the mycelium and the spores and so on. Please try to break down for us a beginning understanding of the subsections, the pieces of the mushroom, and what the value is for us as human beings and our relationship with them. Well, the obvious one that we've just talked about a little bit is the fact that it's decomposing everything out there. It's part of the natural cycle in terms of building up soils. So that's number one. Number two, and I, I, what is, I think is, is quite important for us is as a food product. Now, here's what's interesting is when I started growing mushrooms in 1973, I mean, there wasn't a lot of interest in mushrooms. The per capita consumption of mushrooms in the United States was really low compared to other parts of the world. So mushroom growers at the time, although they've been growing mushrooms in the United States since the early 1900s, it was still one of those foods that was sort of looked at as, you know, this is kind of a garnish. It's uh, something for flavor that you put into something else. Maybe you eat it with your steak. In fact, there was even a mushroom company called Steak Mate. So the point was that classically trained nutritionists looked at mushrooms and went, there are no calories here. Mm -hmm. Mushrooms are low in calories. If you don't have calories, a nutritionist would say, well, 
what's the point? Why should we eat this thing if there's no calories? We, we need the energy from our foods, right? So it, here it is. It's a low-cal food, which later on becomes a positive. Uh, it's a low-cal food, and so they think there's no nutrition here. The fact of the matter is that that's absolutely wrong. Mushrooms have a high-quality protein uh, for a vegetable. It's very good. It's, it's got all of the major amino acids that we need except for one. Mushrooms are mostly carbohydrates. Uh, mannitol is one of the primary carbohydrates in there, which is a very slow-acting something that's very good for us. In fact, they, that's part of what uh, kind of fills us up. That In fact, they say eating mushrooms is really good for you if you're on a diet in the sense of, okay, yeah, you eat them, it, it fills you up. They're, mushrooms have chitin, which is a structural uh, carbohydrate, which makes it a little bit slower to digest. And chitin actually, and, and this is where mushrooms have a lot of fiber. So chitin is part of that fiber, and it goes down and feeds your microbiome. Mm -hmm. Now, all mushrooms have these compounds in their cell walls called beta-glucans. Beta-glucans have been extensively researched for their immunological activity. So we've got a food here that has not just got these nutrients in it. It also has B vitamins, riboflavin, niacin, thiamine. It's got a good quantity of potassium, phosphorus. I mean, we're talking about something that is really very, very nutritious. And what's interesting, too, is some people now talk about it as sort of like that missing link in a way. You know, we, we eat a lot of animals. We eat a lot of vegetables and fruits. Mushrooms kind of reside right in the middle there. You know, they're not a, uh, an animal. They're not a plant. They have their own kingdom. The interesting part about mushrooms, too, is that mushrooms, as their storage carbohydrate, they have glycogen. That's our storage carbohydrate. They don't produce starch. They don't have cellulose. No, they have glycogen. It's really interesting how they're kind of, in a sense, that third, I mean, they're, they're a different kingdom. They're the third sort of leg here. That is kind of what maybe a lot of people are missing in their diets. And listen, all throughout Asia, Eastern Europe and Europe, mushrooms are a big part of the diets of those places. Mm -hmm. They've been eating mushrooms for thousands of years. And boy, if you think about a, a food, I mean, think about somebody thousands and thousands of years ago out foraging or whatever, and in the fall or in the springtime, they see these beautiful, big <laughs> mushrooms there. They're just like, okay, they experiment with them. It is meaty. In fact, in the 17th century in the UK, they called mushrooms poor man's meat. <laughs> oh, they did. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, one thing I want to mention real quickly, folks, because just as Jeff was getting into this, and he was talking about some terms that are not in everybody's uh, straight-up language skills, but he does offer a PDF. It's going to be at the website. We're going to have it as a download, Redefining Medicinal Mushrooms. It's a PDF. And in that PDF, I just looked briefly at it before we got started here, and it's loaded with really cool scientific information about what is the, you know, he's, he's talking about these from a, these items uh, in our discussion because he knows everybody here is not a trained uh, biologist. But when you get into that sheet, you can really get into, in the PDF, you can see some much more interesting elaborations if you want to take it a little bit further. So I just want to make sure you guys know that it's going to be there on the website. So, you know, I'm going to take a quick break right now, but I want to ask you something when we get back because we've kind of teased everybody up right now. And I feel a little bit teased myself because I, I, you know, just participating in this interesting conversation. But what I want to ask you when we get back is, are there specific mushroom anatomical pieces of the mushroom that have specific nutritional medicinal value? If we could talk about that, because I, I think that we could probably talk for two or three hours on that, but if we could have a little touch on that. I've already talked to Jeff. I want to have him to come back because I know we're not, we're just going to scratch the surface on mushrooms. But anyway, when we come back, that's the question I'm going to ask you, Jeff. We'll be back, folks, in just a minute. Today, the world of mind science, psychiatry, and mental health is rapidly changing with innovative, comprehensive testing that takes both patients and practitioners into a new world of measured details with useful, understandable, and remarkably actionable plans. The key phrase here is cost-effective. 
Testing also introduces a key parallel word for predictability. Psychiatric treatment failure, especially after multiple medications and our brief hospitalizations, arises directly from the complexity of measurable brain-body imbalances and impediments that explicitly interfere with medical outcomes and create costly difficulties with inadequately informed supplement and medication trials over time. Great Plains provides a leadership team of biomedical experts with advanced laboratory insights approved nationally both by the FDA and CLIA laboratory certifications and is available internationally for both public and medical professionals. Great Plains Laboratory is the primary laboratory we've used at CoreSight for years with excellent customer service for both patients and medical colleagues. They are on the spot, they get it every time. In addition, they provide exemplary training modules, which are webinars and conferences, in an effort to broaden practice perspectives wherever you live. Do follow up on one of these complimentary test offers today at http greatplainslaboratory.com forward slash cbj. Yeah, that's Core Brain Journal CBJ. Well, welcome back, listeners. You know, this is just the beginning of a very interesting conversation. I mean, who would have ever thought the commonplace mushroom would have such an interesting science behind it, uh, this whole life form that's kind of out of our range that we can't see, and the medicinal value is what we're going to talk about now, folks. And, and I'm not going to try to formulate the question. It's a, it's a macro question. It's a large question because I want Jeff to just say, look, let's start here. We just have to start somewhere with it. We know that, hey, they have some trace elements and so on. He was just talking a little bit about the nutritional value. But let's try and break it down and get even more focused because we're all curious about this very unique food product and what it can do for us. Well, I mentioned what are called beta-glucans. Beta-glucans are what are considered to be a polysaccharide. And polysaccharides, a lot of people say polysaccharides are, are what are complex polysaccharides, what are missing in our diets. But, but a, a beta-glucan is a series of glucose molecules strung together in a very specific way and mushrooms contain these beta-glucans in their cell wall. Beta-glucan is what researchers have demonstrated have all the immunological activity in the mushroom. So those are what are considered to be the most important component of the mushroom. And here's what's kind of interesting is that I've got a book, and in this book, it lists 272 different medicinal mushrooms. Oh my God. <laughs> okay. Well, so look, there are about a dozen where there's a large body of scientific research. And one of the things that, that I've done and, and what I do in my company is that we, ha we look at the traditional use and we say, okay, what mushrooms were the primary mushrooms used in, let's say, traditional Chinese medicine? Then I'll go out into the, the science realm and I'll go, okay, how much research has been actually published on these specific mushrooms. And yeah. so those are the two things that I look at before I say, okay, this mushroom absolutely is one of the premier medicinal mushrooms, and that's what we would offer to the market. But what makes the mushrooms medicinal, and first of all, let me just say, I think all mushrooms are medicinal, but some are just more so than others. Mm -hmm. And this gets back to the actual architecture of the beta-glucan itself. Oh, it does. Okay. Because beta-glucans are have different branchings, and these mushrooms have what's considered a beta-1316 branching. You, you know, cereal grains have beta-glucans in them, and, and cereal grains do have benefits, but the fact is, is that even though they are a beta-glucan, they have a completely different architecture than these specific mushroom beta-glucans. And they are not immunologically active in the same way. They don't have anywhere near the same level of activity that these fungi do. So it's the beta-glucan architecture of the mushroom that makes it medicinal. And that's what makes the difference between one species or another. The architecture and the way that beta-glucan is put together will actually have an effect on what its benefits are. So a couple things happen here is that 
recognizing that the beta glucan is the important medicinal compound, and I would say it is the primary compound, uh, we have uh, got a test. We've got a test where we can actually measure the beta glucan level in mushrooms. And you know what? Let me tell you, yeah, this was a huge breakthrough because all during the 90s, imagine this, if you will, for a minute, Dr. Parker, I'm traveling around China, and China is the birthplace of mushroom cultivation. Mm -hmm. They started cultivating mushrooms in China in the 12th century. They've been doing it a, a long time. And as I'm going around, I'm visiting research institutes. I'm visiting farms. I'm visiting, uh, I go to conferences. And whenever I'm, I'm visiting, let's say, a company that's processing them and, and wanting to sell products, they show me their product and they say, wouldn't you love to buy this mushroom product? I look at it and all I see is a brown powder. <laughs> I have no the idea. The architecture's gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have no idea what that is. Wow. And so from the very beginning for me, I had to look at this and go, you know what? I need some tests to where I can actually measure yeah. what science has told us are the active compounds in these mushrooms. Wow, so interesting. That was very, very important to me because I don't want to go out to the market with a brown powder and say, <laughs> here's this wonderful mushroom product. <laughs> it's really cool. Somebody told me it was great. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And, and, and literally, that's kind of what, what it gets to be out there at times. It's like, oh, because there's been so much hype about some product, now it's the king of this or the king of that, and it's the new superfood. And it's like, well, I hear so much of that. I just call it marketing speak. And right. I'm not interested in marketing speak. I'm not, I don't use marketing speak. I want to know and I want to provide my customers. And again, I'm a business to business. I sell to other businesses. They take our mushroom extracts. They put it out into the capsules, bottles, put their label on it. I want to guarantee that they're getting a good product. I don't mm -hmm. want to be selling just some powder. I, I, that's not, <laughs> to me, it's not ethical. Well, there's a certain point where you just know too much. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, if, if right. you really that's know right. what's going on, that's you right. just can't do it any other way. That, I mean, that, that's I, mean right. I see that in psychopharmacology all the time. You got, you got people that have no idea what they're doing. They're slopping around and telling you how wonderful it is. And then we see second opinions from them. But when you actually know what's going on, you get really crazy about doing it right. You just want to do it right. Absolutely right. And you know what? This is all about people's health, for goodness yeah. sake. I mean, listen, I've spoken to people on the phone you know, as far back as the 90s. They call me up. They say, I've got cancer. I've heard about these medicinal mushrooms. Can you help me? Can you imagine selling them a brown powder? <laughs> no. No, of course not. It doesn't make any sense. But it, no. is, it is humorous. Because it, it'll happen. It'll happen. Oh, oh my goodness. As oh. sure as the sun rises tomorrow, it's going to happen. So, so here's, I discovered this beta-glucan test very late in my business here. And before that, I used to measure what were, I used to measure the polysaccharides. And the polysaccharides, this is what they told us were important. And the beta-glucan is a polysaccharide. So we would measure polysaccharides. And, and if the number was high, we would go, yes, this is a good product. I finally, about five years ago, got a test that was specific to the beta-glucans. Oh, yeah. We could go into it a little bit deeper and actually test the beta-glucans themselves, specific beta-glucans to fungi, to mushrooms and yeast. So this, this wasn't a beta-glucan that you can measure beta-glucans in grains, but no, this test was for mushrooms and mm. yeast, for fungi specifically. So all of a sudden, I can now qualify my products directly to what is important, which are these beta-glucans. And that's what happened is I took a bunch of samples of the actual dried mushrooms that were the important dried mushrooms. Mm -hmm. I took a bunch of samples of our mushroom extracts that we were making. And then I also went on the internet and I bought 40 products right off the internet that were mushroom products. What I discovered in my test was that, okay, I got a baseline for the dried mushroom. Okay, great, now I know this is what a dried mushroom will have each specific species in terms of the beta-glucans. Fantastic. The other thing that this test showed me was what are called 
alpha glucan. So it was not just measuring the beta glucan, it was measuring the alpha glucan. The alpha glucan, alpha glucans are starch. Mushrooms do not have starch. Again, a mushroom has glycogen. So the alpha glucan would measure the glycogen, but what was happening now is in my dried mushrooms, I would see beta glucan, 25 to 50% beta glucan. Alpha glucan, 1% or 2%. Fabulous. I've got a baseline here. Mm -hmm. Tested my extracts. The extracts lined up very nicely with the dried mushroom, which is what I want. I want to maintain that profile of the original herbal material, mushrooms in this case. Mm -hmm. The products that I bought off the internet actually were just the opposite. They mm -hmm. were low beta glucan and very, very high alpha glucan. Oh my gosh. Now, here's the reason. The reason was that these products, although they called themselves mushroom, they were actually mycelium, but the mycelium was grown on sterilized grain. And at the end of the process, they did not remove the grain from the product. So what you ended up with was mostly starch yeah. from the grain. And I mean the beta-glucan content, um, the mean level of beta-glucan in these products was about 6%. The mean level of starch in these products was 35%. Oh my gosh, yeah. So can you imagine the beta-glucan is the active compound in a medicinal mushroom, but in fact, there was next, some of the products had, had down as, much, as low as 1%. Oh my gosh. And some of them had starch levels as high as, I'm not kidding, as high as 70% starch. Now, here's where it gets interesting, very interesting for me too, is that starch is a polysaccharide. Here I was and everybody else back in the years going, if this product has a high polysaccharide level, it's a great product because high polysaccharides, that's where the beta-glucans are and all that. I had no idea. And now all of a sudden I realized polysaccharide test is absolutely taking you in the wrong direction. It's showing you, I mean, somebody could have very high polysaccharides. And I discovered this with some products that I measured was that were not mycelium on grain, but were actually supposed to be mushroom products. It turns out they had high alpha-glucan and very low beta-glucan. And here's what happens, too, is, is in the herbal industry, what happens is polysaccharides, which are like maltodextrin or dextrose or something, are often used as carriers for extracts. I'll be done. So here it is. The polysaccharide test, all of a sudden, it's like this polysaccharide test is absolutely invalid. It, it cannot be used for mushrooms, and yet there's still companies out there that are that are selling their products based on polysaccharide tests. Well, if you were selling these myceliated grain products, that's the test you'd want to use, right? Yeah. Because yeah. it, it would show it helps you sell them. polysaccharides. Yeah. It's but marketing you, value. Well, exactly, exactly. So this beta-glucan test, in fact, what it did is it unmasked a whole level of products that were in the market. And here's the worst part about it. The worst part about it is that these products, if you look at the label, the label said shiitake mushroom reishi mushroom. It had a picture of a mushroom. It was being sold as a mushroom. And, you know, let's get back to plant parts. Mushroom, mycelium, spore. It's like any, if you're into herbs at all, or even any kind of, uh, for example, let's just say a food product. <laughs> now, do you eat that ear of corn or do you eat the stalks or do you eat the <laughs> You eat the corn cob. I think the corn cob is absolutely delicious. Well, exactly. Exactly. And so this is what we're dealing with here. It's kind of like saying, yeah, I'm going to sell you this plant, and I'm going to sell you the soil that it's grown in. It's wild. So no. wild. And look, we confirm that as well with other compounds that are in mushrooms, one of which is a compound called ergosterol. I saw that in your, I saw it in your material. Ergosterol yeah. is so interesting because it's the fungal sterol, much like we have cholesterol, a mushroom has ergosterol, the fungal sterol. Well, ergosterol is used by grain companies, believe it or not, to test for contamination of their grain. So all those big grain conglomerates out there, when they harvest the grain, what are they afraid of? They're afraid of aflatoxins. 
And where aflatoxins yeah. come from? They come from fungi. Yeah, right. Very specific fungi. So if that fungi gets in, and that's your mold, right? So yeah. it's mold. Okay. Mm -hmm. Moldy grain can be contaminated with aflatoxins. So what do they test for to find out if there's any fungi in that grain? They test for ergosterol. Well, we do a big ergosterol study. We find out what the mean value of ergosterol is in a mushroom. We test these other products that are myceliated grain. What do they have? They have a tenth the level of ergosterol that should be in a real fungal product. So all of this, what, what I'm getting at here is that what it's demonstrating is that there are products out there that were being sold as mushroom that actually had next to no fungal tissue in them. And didn't have the nutritional value. I mean, no, no, no. In fact, no. they had the antithesis of the <laughs> nutritional value because it was a corn cob. <laughs> that's right. If you wanted starch, then that's what you were getting. You were getting starch. And then, but you know, this brings up another thing because we're going to run out of time here. But I want to ask you this other question, which is right here. These principles of measurement and science are right in line with everything we talk about all the time at Core Brain Journal. We think the entire system needs to be revised dramatically to deal with the data that's out there rather than the hocus pocus guesswork based on appearances. You and I are say, talking exactly the same language and you're using your language in a very specific medium that has nutritional value, has a potential benefit for a number of people, uh, humankind, but people aren't thinking about it correctly. They're, they're, not, they're being a global and superficial about it. So I'm going to ask you one question here. It's going to be the beginning of our next conversation, Jeff, okay? And listeners, we have not rehearsed this, but it's just, this is so much fun listening to this guy. We're going to have him back. And he's, he has agreed to come back, but this part of the conversation, we have not rehearsed this. I'd like you, as we wind down a little bit, to talk about my ears perked up about three or four times because you did mention immunity. And you were talking immunity in the cell wall of the microorganism, the, 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 the mushroom wall, I guess. I'm trying to figure out what that's it is. That's right. No, the mushroom cell wall. That's right. Yeah. But as soon as you said immunity, that tweaked me up because then I wonder what the across availability of that immunity is to a human being when and what, how does that immunity activity take place from the cell wall for that organism? Well, yeah. what it is, is, is the beta-glucan is not something that is protecting that mushroom. Okay. It's basically this, the beta-glucan is a, a structural part of the cell wall. It, it is a part of that mushroom. Okay. And where the beta-glucan comes in is it stimulates natural killer cells. It oh, it does. Okay. Macrophages. That's what it's doing. So when we consume mushrooms, those uh, beta-glucans, they come down. We actually have a receptor in our, our lower intestine and on our immune cells for beta-glucan. Oh, is that right? No, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like yeah. this is like a home run when we're getting ready to finish the inning here. I'm telling you, this is yeah. That and literally, we have receptors for those beta-glucans. So the beta-glucans, we consume them. And again, mushrooms are not uh, highly digestible, but they come down and they get worked on in the lower intestine. They they actually, with all the fiber in mushrooms, they feed the microbiome as well. But they're coming down and they're hitting those receptor sites. And that's where we get the immune benefits from them. And listen, the, the thing with mushrooms is, is that it's not like taking an aspirin. It's not like taking an ibuprofen. Your immunity tomorrow is not going to be so enhanced that you just walk out of the wheelchair and away you go or anything <laughs> like that. You know? Bulletproof, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's not how it works. It actually, you know, it, it's something you have to consume in a regular way. It's working in the background. I look at, at mushrooms as um, prevention. And that's where let's face it, that's where diet is so important. Diet is our first line of prevention. That's what really keeps us healthy. And if we have a good diet, we can generally speaking, you know, notwithstanding other bad habits like smoking or drinking or whatever, what have you, but the diet is, is like the key. That's the foundation that we've got. So putting mushrooms into that foundation is a way to enhance your immunity because they're there and when they're needed, they will start to help you generate those immune cells that then can help you to ward off some of the infections or you know it's interesting because in japan they actually produced a pharmaceutical from a mushroom they mm -hmm. produced a pharmaceutical they actually two pharmaceuticals that are actually 
drugs that are recognized drugs in Japan. One, one of these was actually produced from shiitake mushrooms. And you know, you know the thing with drugs is that, that drugs, the difference between drugs and, and let's say natural medicines or natural products or even our diet is that drugs are a single solo sort of compound and that makes it very difficult for let's say um, natural products mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. Be, be even yeah. looked at in any way but in this case they they purified this beta glucan they they purified a a beta 1 3 glucan and the name of it was lentinin so an approved drug in Japan lentinin and another one that they purified is called PSK and PSK is used extensively in Japan, and it's used as an adjunct therapy to, to cancer treatment. So they use it along with chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and the whole function of that is to just help your immune system cope with the tremendous damage that is being done by the chemotherapy and the radiation. So It's just interesting because what is it that they utilized in these so-called drugs? Well, they utilized the beta-glucan. That was the key that they utilized there. So again, the evidence that we've got, scientific evidence that we've got is is strong. It's very, very deep. The number of papers that have been written is so extensive. And that's just the tip of the iceberg here. And you know, the beta-glucan is sort of like an immunotherapy. It's kind of one of the avenues that they're starting to go down now in terms of of any kind of illnesses that where the immune system is compromised. that They're really working hard on that to see if they can't come up with something they can utilize to help us out. Jeff, we're going to close here pretty quickly, but I want to tell you, this is a great segue into our next conversation. Because what I want to ask you about the next time we get together is to, it sounds like there's some more to say about this, and I have to cut you off because we got to wind up, but I can see where we go down this this road and more specific issues that I think would be germane and quite interesting to the audience would be your specific suggestions about what specific mushrooms, to your knowledge, have proven valuable or have some scientific evidence with specific maladies. You know, it could be. Well, it may dementia, whatever. Yep. Um, yep. Irritable bowel. It doesn't matter. Yep. We just we we could talk a little bit about that. Then we can get right down to where the rubber meets the road. And again, I know you, I know you now, I didn't know you before we started talking, but you're a scientific guy. You're going to, here is the data. Just, this is what the data says. You're not going to be. So, so important. Absolutely. We're not going to do the smoke and mirror. So I think that's why people want to come back and listen to you. And Jeff, I just want to thank you so much for coming on board. This has been a very interesting conversation. I, and I hope our listeners, I, I can't imagine that people wouldn't be as terribly interested I think I'm coming from sort of a mushroom background without knowing it because it's one of these things where you, you know, when you pick morels when you're a kid and you fry them up with catfish, <laughs> you've entered a different land. I'll tell you that. And That's right. You do not forget. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming on board and we'll look forward to our conversation next time. It's a great conversation. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Parker. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications like those written for ADHD are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.